Okay, so now I'm going to focus on the demographic changes and the older patient. And uh, John started to smoke when she was 21 year old and she stopped when she was 117 and actually she never was in an ED. Um, she died at the end uh, of 1990s, 122 years old, and she still is in the book of Guinness. And uh, not everybody is as healthy than she was, and I think we have a big problem in the future concerning aging population, concerning aging patients. And when we have a look at that sheet, actually in 2020, there are more old people worldwide than we have young people. And we have to consider this in working in ID as well. I talk about this problem because the tsunami wave already arrived at my hospital. I have more than 30% 30 30 of all my patients. They are older than 75 years old. And we really get problems. And we have to see medicine as well in a totally different way. So, looking at international population prospects, Germany already has that problem. France is getting behind. And when we look at Japan, Singapore, all the Asian countries, they really have this problem we are facing now in Germany as well, and the other countries will come after. So, it's a big challenge in ID to deal with the elderly. It's like we say in Germany, to search the needle in the hay. And it's uh, difficult, and we run against time, like always, concerning overcrowding and other things. So what is the problem? We have a big amount of old, pe um, old patients not having nonspecific complaints. You can't really say, using Manchester as a triage, she has chest pain, she has abdominal pain. They just come in and say, well, I'm not feeling fine. And um, you start somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Then the mental awareness, many of them have dementia or they have a delirium. They can't really tell you what's going on. We have polypharmacy. It's normal that those old patients have more than 10 medications and drugs. We have immune paralysis, and that's a big, big issue as well concerning sepsis, because they won't answer with a lycocytosis or CRP, and even PCT is a problem. They don't have fever. And so where are we heading for? They don't have the heart rate accelerating because they have this normal, fragile changes in their body. And often we have an incomplete history taking because nobody really can take a, a tell us what's, what's the problem with her, why did she change, how long is she changing? And for these old patients, they have big problems in our ID as well, because it's an unfamiliar environment. They often have pain and we don't really realize and we don't treat the pain. There's noise, there's rumor, and it's a stressful situation. They have hunger and thirst because there's not a service person coming giving them something to drink. And they sit for hours in these heavy wheelchairs and I don't know if somebody from you, of you took place in such a wheelchair for one hour. If they are happy, they can lie down, but most of them, they sit in these chairs. And this causes stress, and this causes delirium. And so they get a bad outcome just for the fact that they are staying in our Ds for, for hours. So we tried to implement a new pathway, and we have a kind of special unit for elderly patients we call, well, elderly unit. That's a room where we don't have the noise of the monitors, and there's a special service craft that was skilled in geriatric assessments. And he's actually taking care of those patients. So he has a normal job, 40 hours a week, so we can only take the patients for about 30% in this unit. So we start with assessment of admission data, like you all, and then all of our patients get a triage. We use Manchester triage system. We take the vital signs, the vital signs, and it's very important to take the breath rate. Um, we assess pain and acuity, and they get drugs if they have pain. 
and we take blood samples and for many values, POCT, because we want to shorten the time, the decision time, and that's what Eric just told a couple of minutes ago. And then the people are taken into this elderly care unit and they get a very special geriatric assessment that combines some scores like CHEM score or like ISA and there are other uh, things that are being coordinated. And in this unit, we try to get a urine sample because it's something it's sometimes difficult. They don't give you urine right away. You have to wait. We make ECG and depending on, they get an X-ray. And then afterwards, if we have this collection of data, they get a physician's examination, and if they have a need, a special geriatric examination as well, and being taken care. So I just have a look on this geriatric screening tool we use. It's implemented into our software, and um, we have a sign that's going to get read if we have somebody above the age of 75 years or if he's 65 years and above and has some deterioration in mental awareness. So then there's a red flag and this chap is going to evaluate these patient in this uh, special way. And we are targeting for seniors at risk. So we take a look at cognition, locomotion, autonomy, nutrition, and then you get a, well, a advice what to do, actually. And uh, if you use the ISA score, isolated, most of those patients have more than six drugs. So actually, everybody is positive, and it doesn't really help you in finding the patients that need geriatric support. Everything seems so easy when you have a symptom, like chest pain. Well, you know what you are going to do. So, Here's a small case report. It was a male, 73 years of age, and he had, was admitted by a general practitioner through the medical service team. And it was in January, and we had a big wave of people with norovirus. So the um, medical staff team told us, well, we think he has gastroenteritis, and I th well, we presume he has norovirus. Because since three days he was vomiting, he felt weak, and his general practitioner already took away his antihypertensive medication, and he said he is hypovolemic, and uh, he can't stay home with his gastroenteritis. So he was triaged, and actually, he didn't complain about abdominal cramps, pain, and he had no diarrhea. He had a hypertension, he had a good heart rate, he had no fever, he had a good saturation, and a good respiratory rate. And he was not mental, um, well, diminished. So what do you think? What would you do now with this kind of patient? Pneumonia? Pneumonia? Oh. Hypo. <laughs> Maybe the next generation. Very good. No pain. <laughs> Just a bit weak. And the problem, well, we, 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 we take blast guard samples right in the triage. That was normally, although he had a hypertension, so lactite by that time was, uh, well, normal. But then 15 minutes later, we had the POCT values of troponin E and uh, pro-BNP. And we used these parameters to screen elderly patients if they have nonspecific complaints. Only in that case, not all of our patients. When they can't tell us what's really wrong and they don't have any typical signs. And uh, so in between the 15 minutes time, we had these values and he was taken to catheter lab and that's the result. And he survived. If we only take the normal lab and I calculated our turnaround times as well, it takes us really a bunch of time and after one hour, we would have had the results. So and that's the benefit of point of care, using it in the triage system. Now, we made some uh, studies, and um, I have about, uh, by that year when we were doing the study, 2012, we had more than 26,000 patients. 
and we were um, tracking the patients that had signs of, uh, well, cardiac insufficiency or myocardial infarction. That's like chest pain, palpitation. And um, besides this, we checked the, all the patients with nonspecific complaints. And patients above 65 years of age in my district, there were several that had heart infarction. And if you yeah, take this recommendation, the guidelines, they tell you that you should have a look at nonspecific complaints in the elderly. So um, the disease prevalence is quite low, but my hospital is a private hospital and I'm on the stock market. So, you know, I'm actually, I have to be more secure what I'm doing. It would be a problem, you know, if, if I'm standing in the newspaper that I did not um, found out that heart attack and heart infarction by a patient. So it's, you have to discuss if you make this kind of screening with this kind of disease prevalence, but it had a very, very high likelihood ratio above 13. And it's uh, higher than chest pain because on all, only 20% of your chest pain patients, they have a myocardial infarction. It's not so sensitive. Okay, now to the next top of the pops, and that's the fall in the elderly. And we see here now, the, um, well, every 30 seconds in the US, people are admitted to ED because they have falls. And the unintentional fall death rate really climbs up. So it's an issue we have to talk about. Another case report. An old lady admitted to the hospital, to the ED, and she, well, fall, she had a head laceration. She's 86 years of age, and he, she had a history of repetition falling. She said, well, in the last three days, I fall, I fall every day, and, but there was no history of syncope. So she, she could tell us why she fall. She, she just said, oh, there was suddenly a weakness, and I, uh, I fall over. So what would you do with somebody at the age of 86? Okay, I think everybody would do a CT and you would check if there's some pain uh, at the bone sides and exclusion of bone fracture. But uh, what are you going to do with the cause of fall? What was actually wrong with her? Because she had no fractures and she had no hematoma, but she had another problem, and we have to face this problem. Uh, a couple of days before she left hospital, and she already had a hyponatremia, and she came back before it was mild, and now it was more severe. And um, she was discharged, and she had a change of medication because she has a, a epilepsy due to a glioma, and so there were some new drugs like topiramat, carbamazepine, torazimide. Okay, aspirin we know. But these medication cause hyponatremia, and that was her problem. Because there are many drugs in the elderly and in the youngs as well that cause these electrolyte disbalances that can cause in the elderly fall. Why? Now that was a survey and uh, the other people having a mild hyponatremia and they have this gait pattern. It looks a bit disturbing, doesn't it? So and then they, it was equalized and you see it's not more that imbalanced. And that, then they took young people and made gait patterns, normal gait patterns, and then they gave them alcohol. And they had the same alcohol than mild hyponatremia with elderly patients having, well, I think it's two beers, huge beers, mass from Munich. And uh, imagine that, you know, these old people always drink two mass of beer and then you let them walk. And you think it's strange that they come every day back in my ID. So you have to face hyponatremia and you have to treat it. And this hyponatremia causes a lot of problems. 
It's the most common electrolyte imbalance in the elderly. People have poor outcome. The mortality, hospital mortality rises. The length of stay rises and the institutionalization. And I think this is what we don't want. My mother-in-law, she's 95 years old, and she's still taking care of 2,000 um, meters in square garden. And I don't want to be put in the asylum. So, and it's, we, we have to think about our families as well. And it's easy that they won't come out in a normal way of hospital. And there's a lot of literature. So we now started to search for hyponatremia at the age of above 70. And we have this special program. So here you can see if the patient is above, we make a blood gas analysis to have a look at the level of electrolytes. And we have a special lab because you afterwards have to deal. Why do they have hyponatremia? There are many different causes, and you have to treat them in a different way. And you need the serum osmolarity and the urine osmolarity too to decide if it's an inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Um, if you want to calculate the electrolytes, you have to be careful because if you do it in the central lab, you have an indirect photometry. And this might have um, a pseudo hyponatremia. That's in case of levels of high lipid and protein um, contents. So there may be a disimbalance and false positive uh, values. So we screened 1,175 patients and 12.5% uh, of my patients had a hyponatremia. And when you consider the faults without syncope and without other reasons, just a fall, then there was uh, in 61% unsteady gait, and in many times that's due to hypertension medication, so you really have to check the medication, and more than 25% only due to hyponatremia, so it's a big issue we have to deal with. And the etiology and treatment is different. So if you see and realize that they have hyponatremia, you shouldn't just give them volume and some uh, sodium that might kill them. You really have to, well, examine them and find out what's the problem. Maybe it might be drugs. Maybe it's, there's a comorbidity. So if they have a heart failure, it's due to the water that's inside and making a lower osmolarity because uh, they have a heart failure. And, um, and if they have an uh, inappropriate um, antidiuretic hormone, you have to treat it in a different way as well. So, and I'll leave you now some time for discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.